Hello and welcome to the Wormhole Podcast, episode 68. I'm Charlie Place and joining me today is the author of an absolutely wonderful dual timeline novel, Big on Big Houses, Lost Love and Peacocks. It's aptly named The Peacock House. Hello, Kate Glanville. Hello, Charlie. You're in ceramics. I'm going to ask you in detail about that later. But ceramics is what you see first when you go onto your website. Can I ask, when did you first decide you wanted to write and how does that, when did that start kind of thing? Well, I think it started when I was about eight, really, when I started to read books, story books myself and other stories came to me in my head and I began to think, oh, I would like to write a book. And then for the next 32 years, I tried very hard to start writing books, but never got much beyond the first page. But I have dyslexia. So at school, I was always told I was good at art and not so good at anything academic because my spelling was so bad and I'm a very slow reader. So I thought my dreams of being a writer were quite unrealistic, really. But luckily, I persevered. And here I am. But I started, well, I I did a degree in fashion design at St. Martin's. And then I got into decorating pottery through my ex-husband, Duncan Ayscoff. And we started a business together 32 years ago. And 30 years ago, I took that business on on my own. And it's 10 years since my first book, A Perfect Home, was published. But I still see ceramics very much as my day job and writing as my luxury, really. I need to prioritise writing more, I think. I was surprised to find out that you worked in ceramics. I was expecting it to be all books. So I think you're doing well. Oh, thank you. So in 1943, Evelyn is stuck living at the country house of her husband. Howard is away most of the time and is uninterested in her. Howard's mother hates her, and so too does the housekeeper. One day, an American plane crashes on the mountain nearby, and Evelyn, together with two evacuee boys, rescues one of the pilots who can't thank her enough. And in 2016, Bethan travels to the house to interview Evelyn for a magazine she writes for. Evelyn has become a famous romance novelist, and Bethan hopes to get a defining interview of the lady who was her grandmother's best friend, but she finds Evelyn on the floor of the kitchen and her few days' stay turns into a longer one. Kate, shall we have that reading from you about now? Okay, I'm going to read from the first chapter, which is set in 1943, December, at Fawn Court, North Wales. Dismal. It was the only word that Evelyn could think of. Dismal, dismal, dismal. It ricocheted around her head as she stared out of the bay window. The rain ran in unrelenting tears down the diamonds of glass, and the wind moaned through the gaps around the ancient frame. Outside, there was a world of nothing. The garden had completely disappeared into the thick grey mist. It was hard to imagine the view, the sea in the distance, the mountains that swept down to the shore, the rooftops of the houses that clustered around the crescent bay. Evelyn turned and looked around the enormous bedroom. It was much too big for the mean little fire that crackled in the grate. Flopping down onto the eiderdown, she stared at the ornately plastered ceiling. Its Jacobean swirls reminded her of a wedding cake. There had been no cake at her wedding to Howard. Rationing had made sure of that. The war had also made sure that there'd been no white satin dress or trailing bouquet though she wasn't sure the war could be blamed for the lack of other things a bride expected. It had been two years since her wedding day, nearly two years since she had been banished to the land of rain and rocks and shrouding crowd. Two years, Evelyn whispered and saw a puffy air escape between her lips. This would be her second Christmas in Wales, in the huge house, with only her mother-in-law for company at the dinner table so different from the boisterous Christmas at Wilton Terrace, where there had been jokes and riddles and indoor fireworks and endless bottles of champagne from the cellar. There had always been a huge fir tree in the hall, soaring up through the stairwell. Evelyn and her brother and sister had to stand on ladders to decorate it. At Vaughan Court, they didn't have a tree. They are unpatriotic, 
Lady Vaughan had declared when Evelyn had dared to suggest they put one up in the drawing room. We will take no part in Germanic traditions at Vaughan Court. Evelyn wondered if Howard would come to visit this year. She doubted it. His work in Whitehall was much more important than a wife, especially when he had everything he wanted in London. She tried not to think of the letter, the swirling writing, the sickening scent of violets, the words that had suggested an intimacy Evelyn had no experience of. Instead, she glanced over at the jumper she'd been knitting. Her mother-in-law had suggested it as a gift for Howard. It will give you something to do, Lady Vaughan had said. The colour of the wool was hideous. It was all that they had in the town. Evelyn closed her eyes and wished for something to happen. Anything, anything at all, as long as it was something more exciting than the life she had. She opened her eyes at the sound of the rain beating harder against the windows. The moaning of the wind grew louder, more like a howl, and then a roar. She sat up. The window panes started to rattle in their leaden frames, and for a moment everything seemed to darken, as though the shadow of some colossal beast had passed by outside. Then there was a bang, an explosion. The whole room seemed to shake. Evelyn thought the window panes might shatter. Jumping up from the bed, she tried to crane her neck to see from the window, but everything was fog. She heard shouting below her, the boys. A crash, there's been a crash on the mountain. Without even stopping to think, she wrenched open the bedroom door and ran, racing down the long corridor. She had no time to scowl at the beastly portraits. The Persian rug slipped beneath her feet. She almost tripped as she took the steps of the marble staircase two at a time. With an ungraceful skid, she crossed the black and white tiled hall and pulled at the heavy oak door until it opened and she was outside. The rain had turned to sleet, slivers of ice pricking at her cheeks. Her hands were already turning numb. Ignoring the cold, Evelyn ran around the side of the house. The boys were smudges ahead of her, already scrambling up the steep path. Peter, Billy, she called their names and set off as fast as she could, following them upwards, clambering over rocks and boulders. The smell of smoke was thick on the wind, and high above her on the mountainside, something was giving off a ghostly glow. Thank you. So I'm going to ask that samey question. Can you tell us where the story comes from and your inspiration? I think I first started to think about it when I was renting a little cottage behind a big house locally, a Newton House in Deneva Park. It's owned by the National Trust. And when, after my divorce, my three children and I needed somewhere to live, we rented this very pretty little cottage called Dairy Cottage just behind the big house. And it was a wonderful environment to live in, apart from it was very cold and damp. One of the characters I'd written about in Stargazing had been in her late 60s, and I'd really enjoyed writing her character, Nesta. And then I'd written in the Cherry Tree Summer, Martha is in her mid-50s. And I wanted to write about somebody in their 90s and write a positive experience of somebody older and I began to think about an old lady in a big house with a past and what might have happened to her and why she might be in a big house all by herself and then I started to find out a bit more about the history of Newton House and discovered that there had been an army hospital based there during the Second World War and that for a brief period, it had been occupied by some Americans. And someone local who could remember that time as a little boy said to me, it had been as though all the worlds had become technicolor. And then after six weeks, the Americans vanished overnight. And he said, everything became black and white again. And that was like a seed really being planted. Then I also discovered that some of the soldiers had painted large figures on the walls of the room that they used to recuperate in during the day, painted ladies of women, which were similar to the ones that the American Air Force painted on the front of their planes. And I'd always been really interested in those paintings. When I did fashion design, I did a project based on, on them. So I was absolutely fascinated to, to find out that these pictures were still there, but they'd been plastered over in Newton House. 
and they've been plastered over with cement, so they're never going to come back. But a friend of mine, Sarah Rees, who's a conceptual artist and had grown up there, she had found these photographs of these paintings. And as part of an exhibition she had, she'd reproduced the images and projected them onto the walls. So she was able to show me the pictures of the original paintings and of her exhibition. And I just could never pass the place where these paintings have been and not think that they were all still there, all these gorgeous women reclining and looking sexy behind this layer of, of plaster. And what would happen if they suddenly started to appear again? That sort of tied in with my idea about the old woman living in the house. Then at the same time, my eldest son, he's very dyslexic, so he went from sick form to a, a specialist dyslexia school called St. David's College. And I started to do this very long drive, sort of every month, really, from Tandilo up through Snowdonia to Conway. And the landscape is just so stunning in Snowdonia. And I, I really loved that five-hour drive where you'd see the landscape change. And then this incredibly dramatic mountainous landscape and the sea and the way the mountains swept right down to the sea. And I felt that was where I wanted to set the story. So I, I created a, a little tiny village called Abbasaran and a big house called Vaughan Court. But it was sort of loosely based on Newton House in Llandilo, the house, and then also based on another National Trust house, which is near Conway, which is now a hotel, Odis Gallum, who is very expensive. So it's a real treat to stay there. I could only stay there if it was part of research. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's a very good excuse to stay there. So I have to write this book about this house. So, so that was the sort of the idea. And then also when we lived in Dairy Cottage, we had a resident peacock. He sort of lived in the gardens and he was very much in charge of the cottage and sort of came in, inside a lot. And um, it was lovely. It was just lovely sharing our lives with a peacock. And I think that was where the idea came of having a peacock in the house as a character. And, and I went to visit another house, another big house near here, it was full of peacocks, this garden of this big house, absolutely festooned with peacocks everywhere you looked. So that sort of also gave me the idea of a house with lots and lots of peacocks. So yes, those ideas all came together at a similar time. That is a lot of different influences that have, all, yeah, that have come <laughs> together really, really well as well. Yeah. <laughs> well, they, I thought about them and they were sort of brewing away like a soup for two or three years while I was writing The Cherry Tree Summer. Then finishing The Cherry Tree Summer corresponded with lockdown coming. And then The Peacock House was almost a completely fully formed story by that time in my head. And I just, it was wonderful just having the time just to write it. I wrote it in five months and it just poured out, which tends to be how I work really, that I think about things for a long, long, long time before I actually write anything. Yeah, yeah. So you had everything ready to go for the lockdown. That's very, very useful. Yeah. Yes, yes. I wasn't sure how it would end. So I had to sort of wait for that to come. I had to, to write it before the ending appeared. Well, I have got a question about the ending in a bit. We'll, we'll get to it in a bit. But I think it's interesting that for you, that the very start, in context of what you're saying here, the very start was the age of the character. You wanted to write someone who was 90. Yeah. Well, I think I've got lots of very positive experiences of older people, especially women, in my life. And I'm in my mid-50s now, and I don't feel as if I'm getting old, or I don't feel very much different to how I did at 18. I, I don't have a sense of changing or becoming old or dreading old age or or anything, because I think I have had very positive experiences from my grandmother and my mother and family friends and I think I wanted to write about that that you, you can be vibrant and have a full life however old you are really and it's never too late to find love and make changes in your life 
I, I like exploring that and I like the freedom writing older characters gives you. You haven't got the sort of insecurities of youth or the sort of hesitancy. You, know, you can enjoy writing the cantankerous bits. Well, it occurred to me, it was actually a few minutes before we came to record this, it was something that occurred to me. I thought, hang on a minute. Bethan says the F word once, I think. And you've got so much swearing in this book and it's all from Evelyn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, yes. Well, I think uh, I never swear. And my mother, who is 90 next month, is very sweary. She's always swearing. And I was brought up you know, around her swearing. And I don't know why I don't swear. So I'm more like Beth. Than, and uh, I remember when I was in labour with my daughter, the midwife, saying, you know, you can swear if you want to. Um my husband said she won't swear. <laughs> she doesn't swear. <laughs> oh, so you have spoken earlier about the wartime paintings and the hospital, which was very, very interesting. I thought that was made up. In terms of Evelyn's romance, were there any particular wartime stories that influenced you in this way? I think, I well, during my research, I read a lot of different stories of girls who fell in love with American GIs. So I, I did get completely lost in, in that world of women who, and, and often very young girls of 16 or 17, you're meeting these incredibly handsome film star like soldiers you know, having romances. And then a lot of them did go back to America with varying degrees of happiness, really, because they had no idea whether somebody came from some big New England mansion or some tiny farm in Texas in the middle of nowhere. So, so yes, yeah, so I was looking at a lot of those, those stories. I mean, I can't imagine what it would have been like for Evelyn if she had gone back to America with Jack at the time, gone back to his family with their ice cream shop. But I just was really interested in that, that idea of somebody coming from so far away and the whole class system was completely deconstructed during that time. So Evelyn would have, you know, she grew up in a sort of upper class household and she was expected to marry in, into similar strata of society. And that was her life. And I was very interested in that, how the sort of movement between classes is demolished by that sort of chaos of war. You have them having such a long period of time in between when they meet each other again, which was hard to read and also wonderful to read. You've done it so well. But I did want to ask, actually, and this is on the subject, I suppose, so I'll ask it now. I was wondering why you didn't include the actual reunion of Evelyn and Jack in the book. Um, I don't know. I think initially I had planned that reunion once I decided what was going to actually happen because I just couldn't decide whether they would meet up again whether he would still be alive, whether something was going to happen to her before they could meet up. But then I couldn't bear for them not to be reunited. The sort of further I got into the story and the more invested I became in, in their characters, I wanted them to, to be together. But I suppose I thought there would be a reunion that we would see. I, well, I did that in a way from a distance with the use of the videos and the letters so we sort of see their initial reunion in that way with the modern technology i liked that idea that he would send her a message from so far away that she could see that on the computer things they never would have imagined being possible as a way of communicating and i think after i'd done that and they'd made their films and sent their emails i didn't feel the need for us to see them again I think in a way it was important almost that they were those young people, that that's where we saw them together. And that's how they would, would probably feel now. They would feel feel like those young people. We know that they're going to be extremely happy and hopefully live you know, to be 100 and <laughs> be idyllically happy in the summer house by the lake. And I like the fact they don't get married too soon either, that there's three years between their being reunited 
and getting married. So they're not going to rush into anything. <laughs> I don't want them to wait three weeks and then get married. And I felt it was important, knowing Evelyn, that well, I think she's got to forgive him and, and process what happened. And because there are bits of Jack where I, you, know, you just think, well, you should have tried a bit harder. You should have mm-hmm. asked more questions. <laughs> you should have hung around <laughs> longer. What are you doing? <laughs> Yeah, you, you say about the communication, and I, I certainly, yeah, that that's a good point that you kind of bring in the present day communication that we've got now that, of course, Jack couldn't use. And at the same time, yes, why didn't he do further? But I mean, kind of on this, if I kind of take this question and kind of change it slightly, you don't hear from Jack in person. And I also noticed that, you know, you don't hear from Howard, you don't hear from Mrs. Moggs, which is really interesting because then I thought you have lots of potential villains in the book. And I know I was ready for someone to possibly do something big, especially when you've got the house, you know, there's maybe a ghost or someone's getting the house. But in the book, you've only got one person that's kind of a complete villain, as it were, Mrs. Moggs, and she's she's dead. Is a more pleasant cast of characters what you prefer to go for? I think I was aware that in previous books I had had some particularly unpleasant male characters and I I wanted to try and write about nicer men even Howard suffering from post-traumatic stress really I think I didn't want him to be a completely evil character he's just gone through trauma and he's weak and he's got a very domineering mother and you know there are reasons why he behaved the way that he did and he's driven by a desire for finances to shore up the estate so I wanted to write about nicer nicer men (laughs) um yeah I think Mrs Mogg says the villain she is particularly unpleasant especially to the two refugee boys we have Olwyn her daughter is still alive so we sort of see her a bit through Olwyn's eyes who doesn't see her mother as being particularly evil or that her behavior was that outrageous David Dashwood is is a villain, but again, I tried to make him into a nice villain with his own reasons for doing the things that he that he does. Mm. No, I, I I loved it. I mean, I was when you introduced David Dashwood, I was thinking, okay, so the way you set him up, the way that you're describing him, okay, he's he's going to be the bad guy, and then he isn't, which I actually really really liked. Um, I mean, okay, he kind of is, but you've given him a really solid backstory of why. And then at the end of the day, you know, he's he's not an awful man. And I, I just loved it. He has to cope with having twins at the end, which <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed that, giving him toddler twins <laughs> to ruin his, his suave life. <laughs> That's his comeuppance, then. That's his comeuppance, the pair of crazy toddlers that he has to run around after. <laughs> There's, there's definitely an interesting story beyond the pages for him, yeah. The whole range of different people carriers, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I did want to touch on Tilly's fashion. She is just such a character. And I wondered what might be in her future and in the family's future, you know, Tom and Bethan and, and Tilly as a whole. Well, I would hope that Tilly, she's had such a hard time with her mother and her her baby sister dying and, and then she struggled so much at school and I hope for lots of good things for Tilly I hope that Vaughan Court becomes a school for children with dyslexia which is really very like St David's College where my son went that's what I turned it into into a school providing lots of positive experiences for dyslexic children that can build on their confidence and make them realise that being dyslexic or having any kind of learning disability shouldn't be an issue. It's about being comfortable in your own skin and being confident about who you are and it doesn't matter how academic you are or what exams you pass or there's so much more to life, got so much more to offer the world. And so I would hope for Tilly that that school will give her the confidence to go out and do whatever she wants to do. I think she's very creative, as you can see by her clothes. She's very imaginative. She makes up the stories that she made up about the ghosts in the wall. I think Beth Ann will be a lovely stepmother for her and nurture all those positive things about her. 
and I think she'll also make Tom very happy and hopefully some of his demons about what happened to his wife, his guilt and grief will be alleviated by his relationship with Beth Ann. So I, I see positive things for Tilly's future. I think she'll have a lot to offer the world. Uh, excellent. I've got a couple more questions. The first one is you're getting a book completed at the moment. Can you tell us as much as you can tell us about it at the moment? Yes. I've nearly finished the first draft now. In fact, I'm going to take next week, the whole of next week off from doing any ceramics and to really knuckle down and finish this first draft. And my first drafts are quite in-depth, really. So they tend to be, they're quite finished. The first draft is quite a finished manuscript. And it's set in Dublin. It's another dual time novel. So it's set in contemporary Dublin and then Dublin in 1977. Then it's also looking at a storyline from 1948, something that's happened. And again, it's a big house, a big sort of Anglo-Irish Georgian house, which are very common around Ireland. And it's about a little girl who's 10 years old and something happens in Ireland that haunts her for the rest of her life and really shapes the rest of her life exploring really what you see and the truth behind how you interpret a situation and how that can affect you and when I was nine in 1977 my grandmother had a stroke and I woke up one morning and my mum said we had to go immediately to Dublin and we ended up staying there for six months so literally within an hour or two we were at the airport and then everything was left behind Suddenly I had to go to school in Ireland. I had to try to make friends. I had to deal with what was happening with my grandmother, with my mother and her anxiety, with my grandfather. And it's sort of loosely based on that and things that happened then at that time to me that aren't nearly as dramatic as the things that happened in the story, but how the things that I remember and the things that still can make me today feel guilty or anxious so it's sort of what happens to that little girl. And again, it's looking at a woman in her mid-50s that's looking at a slightly older character than your typical romantic heroine. And about someone finding finding love through something that happened in their past and something that's happened in this big house. And it's called Fairy Hill, which is the name of the big house. That sounds like a potentially amazing novel. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing more about it. So I have one more question. You have talked briefly about your ceramics um, at the start. Can you expand on this? Can you tell us uh, what you make, where people can find your work to purchase, etc.? It's hand-painted ceramics using a miolica technique, which is a very old technique like the Italians and the Spanish and Delft pottery from Holland. They all use the same sort of technique and... I used to sell a lot to shops, big shops like Liberty's and the Conran shop and John Lewis and Macy's in New York. But now I do everything online and it's mostly bespoke things. So plates as gifts for weddings or christenings. And I do a lot of tile murals that go behind argas and range cookers or baths or sometimes swimming pools. And I have a website kateglanville.com where uh, you can see examples of my work. Is there anything else that we haven't covered or we haven't talked about enough that you'd like to add to the end of this podcast? Uh, one of the things I think because I'm dyslexic and I think I touched on that in the beginning and I'm very slow at reading and the words sort of jump around the page and it takes me ages to finish a book but I love listening to audiobooks and I think they're a huge part of my life. So when I'm painting ceramics, I'm always listening to an audiobook at the same time. So I get through at least two audiobooks a week. And I think that really helps my writing, listening to somebody else's story being read to me. It sort of helps with the rhythm and the thinking about the words. And it's a different process from when I'm reading when I think I find it harder to actually absorb what I'm reading and 
I know that there's some snobbery around audiobooks and whether it is the same way that whether you can appreciate a book if you're hearing it rather than reading it. I think it's been hugely important to me all my life. I've always listened to listen to story tapes as a child when I was in bed before I went to sleep and story tapes on long journeys. And yes, that's definitely been a big help to me. And I, I love writers. No, it's, it's a very good point. And I think audiobooks definitely are, are starting to become more accepted as a reading because, I mean, they, they're obviously very like books. You've got the same words, but there is a specialness all on their own. Yeah. So... Kate, it has been lovely having you today. I've enjoyed every moment of your book and I absolutely mean it. I'm going to get on and buy another of your books just to get back into the same sort of feel, I suppose, of your writing in a different world. But yeah, thank you very much for being here today. Thank you for our conversation and um, I hope you do very well next week with your uh, editing. Thank you very much for having me on your podcast, Charlie. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Links to purchase The Peacock House are in the episode description. Thank you very much for listening. Please do share this episode with anyone you think would be interested in it. The Wormhole Podcast, episode 68, was recorded on the 8th of September and published on the 12th of September, 2022. Music and production by Charlie Blaise.